Hi, everyone. This is Christine Thompson, lead agent on the CT team at Baird & Warner. I have the good fortune of having a very preferred and experienced lender with me, Kevin Napoleon, to just chat a little bit about mortgages and what you need to be thinking about if you're just, 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 just starting to think about maybe buying a house and you've never worked with a lender, you have no clue what it takes to get a loan. We're not going to be doing a bullet point here of exact stuff that you need, but more conceptually, what you need to be thinking about, maybe preparing a year or two down the road, even if you're thinking of buying a house. So that way, when you think you are ready to make that big move, you are well prepared. So Kevin, welcome. I appreciate you joining me. And if you want to just give your like two second little elevator speech on, you know, you know where you work and all that, this is your chance. <laughs> Well, hello, Christine. Thanks for having me as part of this call. And uh, like Christine said, my name is Kevin Napoleon. I am a mortgage loan officer. I work for a company called Key Mortgage, and I've been in the industry since 2001. This is the only adult job I've ever had in my life. So this is all I know <laughs> and all I plan on doing going forward. So 22 years in the business. So I'm going to guess you've had some experiences working with clients, but let's start. The three main categories I understand that people need to be thinking about is credits, employment, and savings. Is that right? Yeah. And, and that's really what most people have questions on. So every call I get typically starts out the same way as people kind of don't know what they need to know. They don't know how they fit within today's lending world, what the guidelines are. And it's kind of unique because in a day and age where the internet is kind of everything, people assume they can get all their answers, questions answered online. What most consumers are starting to realize, it's almost like information overload. And you don't know what's true, what's not true, or how that information basically is specific to your individual profile as a buyer. So I always like to start out by just telling people, generally speaking, what we look at. What are the things that we're going to kind of talk about as we try to figure out if you meet today's lending guidelines? And that's exactly what you said. So it really boils down to their credit score and credit history, their employment history, income structure. And then lastly, we want to talk about savings because you don't have to be a perfect squeaky clean buyer in order to qualify for a loan, you just have to meet the basic requirements. And that's what I like to do is just kind of tell people what the industry guidelines are and how we interpret those guidelines with their exact situation. So it's, it's so, easy. Yeah. It's just, you know, letting them know what kind of what those policies are nowadays. So let's break it down. Let's, let's just talk about credit scores right now. Uh, everyone thinks they have to have a really good credit score, or sometimes we have clients coming in and they got a, a credit score where it's like, it's below the line here. And what's the lowest you've ever seen that uh, a loan could get accepted? What's the lowest score? Sure. So yeah, there are different programs that are available. There are some that are not really meant for high credit candidates, but if you have really good credit, you're typically going to profile for a certain type of loan is what we refer to as a conventional loan. But then we also have our government backed or government insured loans, which is VA or FHA. FHA is definitely a little bit more lenient. And if you have lower down payment or lower credit scores or a combination of both, that's typically going to be kind of the backbone of that type of profile. The lowest credit score I have ever been able to work with and get someone approved was a 578. Wow, so a 578. 578. What about, you were in the state of Illinois, what about the IDA program? And what exactly does IDA stand for? Yeah, so IDA is the acronym of Illinois Housing Development Authority. And really what that is, is the down payment assistance program. So that's, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's a question that comes up with a lot of first time home buyers because there's a lot of marketing out there tailored to first time buyers thinking that if you're a first time buyer, you get all sorts of benefits and all sorts of options that open up for you. What that really boils down to is you're eligible for some sort of down payment assistance. And that is something that's a state funded program that we simply attach it to a regular conventional FHA or VA loan. So it helps buyers, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, people that don't have a lot of savings, or maybe they didn't plan for a really long time to buy a house, 
you can utilize down payment assistance as kind of a stepping stone into home ownership instead of having to rent for another year. Right. So yeah, I've heard of the IDA, and I don't know if Key Mortgage has this. It's it's a very unusual one that there's a Chinoa loan out there, and I I had a client that did a Chinoa loan, and they brought nothing, they brought nothing to closing, but they did negotiate their closing credits, a closing costs with their seller, so the seller paid their closing costs, and they didn't have to bring anything to closing. It was like a zero down. Which is yeah, some of like, those oh my exist. gosh. <laughs> you know, I, I tell a lot of buyers to be a little bit careful of that because if you Google hard enough, you're going to find a million different programs that are out there. But most of them don't pertain to a lot of the buyers that we're going to talk to. So, for example, there are some home buyer programs that are specific to a certain zip code or a certain neighborhood in the inner city of Chicago. So, mm -hmm. obviously, if you're buying in the western suburbs, you're not going to leverage that program. Or there are some programs for Native American Indians or Native Americans, I should say. And obviously everyone's not going to profile for those types of programs. Some of them are, are bank driven where you have to have a certain amount of deposits on file mm. in order to be able to offer like that program you mentioned might be specific to some sort of local bank somewhere and they have to offer something unique in their community. So the most commonly used one is the one you mentioned is IDA, because that's throughout the state of Illinois. Anybody can use that program as long as you meet their individual requirements. It's not geographically filtered. So you don't have to be in a certain town or a certain county. Okay. So let's get back to credit and credit scores. You know, when you get people coming to you and they got low credit scores, what do you see where it's like, okay, I can see why your credit score is low because of A, B, and C that you've been doing financially. What are what are some of the things that uh, you advise clients that are, have low credit scores, what to do to get that back in order? Sure, yeah, and it's this is something that comes up a lot. And you kind of have two tiers when we're talking about lower credit scores. You have people that just have mildly low scores, and we can provide some guidance and maybe turn that around relatively quickly, meaning in the next 30 days or so. But and what would you, people, well, how would you define that before we get to the next category? You know, what would you define as relatively mildly low, like so, five points, 50, you know, what no, are we talking but maybe about like, here? you know, maybe people that thought they had good credit because their payments have always been on time and they're yeah. thinking they're in the top tier, which is in our, in our industry is 740 or above. We pull credit. And now we have a 640 which is going to be on the lower end of the scale that we can work with, you know, for the standard buyer. So you have that range and then you have someone that might be, let's say at 530, which okay. is pretty much below any qualifying tolerance. So for the people that are mildly lower, if they don't have a long history of negligence on their credit, meaning missing payments and collections, it usually boils down to credit usage, meaning credit cards. If you have credit cards that are maxed out or you have, let's say, over 30% of the limit on your balance, so a $1,000 limit, meaning over a $300 balance, that's okay. going to start to eat away your scores. So the quick fix on that is just pay, if you can, pay down your credit card balances within 30 to 45 days, your scores will rapidly... So what I'm hearing, are you saying... What helps the credit getting better is the ratio of the balance on the credit card to what's allowed to spend on the credit card? 100%. Yep, okay. 100%. So if you have a $1,000 credit card and you have a $980 balance, you're maxing out that line of credit potential, which inherently is negative. When you have a $1,000 credit card and you only have $100 as a balance, that shows that you're not out there just spending all your available liquidity. So, so somebody right. doesn't have to necessarily pay off to a zero balance on their credit card. They just got to get it to a, a very, a, a good ratio where there's still a, a lot available on the credit card. Yeah, you're hundred percent correct. And in some cases, some people might be advised to actually hold a little bit of a balance because if you. Yeah, I've heard that. Why? Why? Yeah, I mean, so, I, I've heard that. And I'm like, I, what's the logic behind that? Because people are like, why? Wouldn't you yeah. want to show that it's completely paid off? Yeah. And credit's kind of a delicate balance. So 
what I've read is that the credit bureaus like to see that you can manage a credit relationship. So, you know, we all have credit to use credit. So if you have a credit card, you know, that's usually what we're talking about. And you use it, you pay it off, and then you use it, maybe pay it down a little bit, and you can show that you're managing that, like I kind of joke around, like, like an adult would, that you are being appropriate with your funds. It it shows that you can manage that relationship very well, and it strengthens your ability to get credit and hold credit. When you get a credit card and boom, you just redline it to the limit, that means you're being a little bit reckless, just like in your car. You get in your car and you floor it, you can't sustain that type of driving. So you have to kind of, you know, press the gas, ease off a little bit. You know, that's kind of my analogy when it comes to spending on a credit card. All right. Uh, So I got a question. I got a story to share. Do you have any stories to share where, you know, someone is like working on getting a loan and stuff and they just did a bonehead move with their credit and you're like, we can't give you the loan now. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately I have, a lot of stories and I'm in the middle of those stories right now. It's like a forever going ongoing process when it comes to credit. And a lot of people don't realize that, you know, when you're in the middle of trying to qualify for a loan, you know, this is kind of like a financial audit that you're going through. And as soon as you start shuffling things around, now we have to shuffle around and chase what you're doing. So when you are usually it's someone buying a car, Or, you know, what I see a lot is people buying a house. They got their new house they want to buy. And of course, you go to Best Buy or some department store and there's a sale on all the appliances. And people want to buy all sorts of stuff for the house they don't own yet. And they want to open up a credit card to get 10% off or 20% off. And they don't realize that puts an inquiry on their credit that opens up a new line of debt. There's a new payment there. It could pull their scores down. So there's a little bit of a ripple effect if that happens. So I will always tell people, try to live the most boring financial life, the most (laughs) boring credit life as you can while you're going through this process and you're going to come out okay on the other end. Yeah, okay. It happens quite often. So I personally, it wasn't a client of mine, but I heard from another agent. This this story just is just unbelievable. So a client was under contract to buy a house. And they were coming from a very small house, moving into a much larger house. And they're like, we need furniture. Yeah. So they went to the furniture store and they, like you said, they opened up the store card, got their discount and they bought a house full of furniture. And then shortly before closing, is this true? Your credit gets pulled again shortly before closing, just to see, is there anything different going on? And they caught all the furniture purchases and the buyer was denied their loan completely. Can't get the loan. And now they were stuck with all this furniture they couldn't return with no home to put it in. They couldn't buy a home. Yeah. <clears throat> and yeah, that is true. We do a, a final check on everything basically right before closing. So we don't actually pull credit. We do what's called a soft pull. We're okay. going to kind of go behind the scenes and see if there's any new debt that's out there or any new negative credit. Like if you have late payments on something or you have a new collection account because you stopped paying bills, Mm. now we have to re-pull credit and capture that new lower credit score. Or if they went out and bought a house full of furniture on a credit card. Yeah, yeah, we'll see that. Really up the balance. Yep, and we have to update (laughs) that as part of your debt. So that's always going to be caught. So you can't get around the system. And I've had people do that thinking that once we pull credit, we only look at it once and they can do whatever they want after that. And unfortunately, that will always catch up to them yeah, at some point throughout the transaction. I tell all my clients, please don't buy anything yeah. unless it's absolutely necessary, like food and gas. <laughs> yeah, car. live your life, right? You, you can still do life. that. You keep yeah, paying your bills. Please don't go out ju- shopping for big stuff. And yeah, something like buy, you don't need. buy all the stuff you want for the house after you close. You can literally go to the store right after closing, do your furniture shop. Yeah. Yeah, you can destroy your credit all you want after closing. Oh, my God. I know. I heard that story. I'm like, oh, my gosh. (laughs) You're stuck with a truck full of furniture showing up to where do we go? All right, let's move. (laughs) Where where do you want the furniture? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) What a mess. Hopefully that got worked out for those buyers. Uh, Employment. So employment's another one. You know, I had... 
I had a client or my, one of my team agents had a client where they're like, well, we're exploring a new profession and we're, we're, we're getting certified and we're going to do a totally new profession. And they were in the midst of working on that while they were looking to buy a house. What would you be saying to these people? Well, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before, like live the most boring financial life you can. The more shuffling around, the more we have to figure that out. So income or employment is something that is not as easy as a lot of people think. You can't just get a job and boom, we use that income. So it depends on the job. Shuffling jobs while you're going through this, it could be okay, but it depends on the income structure. So if you have a regular job now, full-time salary, W-2 position, and then you take kind of what I call like a move-up job, same line of business, W-2, higher salary, you're going to be fine. But if you go into a commission role or something that is performance-based, now we need a track record of you earning income at that pace. So I get this a lot where someone, for example, has a job. They don't make a ton of money. So they think, you know what? I'm going to go get a part-time job at Target. And they call me three days after they get a part-time job at Target, thinking that we're going to use that income. They don't realize that most people don't have multiple jobs at the same time. So the lending guidelines require that we want a history of working multiple jobs. We yeah, can they it. sustain the two jobs? Yeah, yeah because it's know? likely they might that, burn that out part-time job might be seasonal. It might not be what I always call stable and predictable. Yeah. We have to have predictable income. The only way to predict going forward is to show the past that you've been doing it for a while. So a lot of times you may have to do it for 12 to 24 months. So that's where I like to talk to people about just sit down, take a breath and plan out your home buying process. Because if you go start looking at properties and fall in love with something, then you're going to try to force this upon yourself. And maybe you don't have the right income yet or the right employment structure because you're just starting out or you just switch careers or you just started a business. That's another big one. People that start their own business. Oh, let's think, talk about that. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Tax returns, businesses, write-offs, yeah. income so, that it shows. Cause you know, I get people where they're like, I can more than afford this house, right. but I can only get a loan for this little bit because of the tax returns because they have their own business yeah that's that's a big issue that's a big issue for anyone that's been kind of lifelong self-employed business owner and the whole premise behind having a little bit of an issue with that is because the tax laws work to your advantage in the sense that you get to shield a lot of your taxable income with deductions and write-offs so what a lot of people will do is if they make five hundred thousand a year they'll try to drum up five hundred thousand dollars worth of business related expenses which is great for the IRS and is great for your tax liability. When we are qualifying someone for a loan, we go off of what the IRS sees. So we're going to look at that basically zero income in that example. So yeah. you have to structure your income the right way where you're actually showing usable income to the IRS for us to use that. So, and the big thing is if someone is new to being a business owner, we typically need two years before okay. we can utilize that because again, has to be stable and predictable. Owning a business, you know, in this country, just generally speaking, is high risk. A lot of people start a business and it doesn't last very long. So that's mm -hmm. why they want to show a two-year history that you can sustain that type of employment right. environment. Question. So yeah. let's say, you know, they're doing the tax returns and they did all these deductions and they have a life change and they're like, we got to move, we, we want to buy. Can they get their taxes amended? and say, all right, we're going to take off all those deductions. We're going to amend the taxes that we submitted earlier in the year, and we'll just pay more taxes so that way the, the return can show a higher income. Or do they got to wait a whole other year and do another tax return the following year and just change their strategy and say, we're going to have to just pay more taxes so we can show a higher income? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. It's a little bit of a slippery slope. So the quick answer is yes, that can be done, but it has to be genuine and organic, meaning I can't be or someone in my position can't be structuring that for somebody else. So No, I mean, they'd have to go to an accountant and right. have somebody, a licensed accountant, revise their tax return, amend it, resubmit it. Is yeah. that possible, though? 
Yeah, as long as it's real. The only time I've ever seen this become an issue is if someone amends their taxes just for the underwriting process and then they amend them again <laughs> back to where they were before. Now you're okay. structuring, getting around a loophole. That's where it becomes kind of misleading information. So yeah. you could do that. It just has to be right. You know, it has to be like a forever amendment in theory. So that's what yeah. I will tell people. Just be careful. You don't want to try getting around guidelines. Make sure it's all real and legitimate. Yeah, no one wants to go to jail. To play around. Well, I mean, that, would that start being considered fraud if people were trying to manipulate it and bounce back and forth on an, uh, amending their taxes just for an interim while they're trying to get a loan? Like, when did they get in trouble yeah, doing that? I don't know if that was, if it's necessarily fraud, but I know that, you know, the underwriters look out for that stuff. And when they see the amended return, you know, usually you can see why something is amended, like someone okay. forgot to add income or they yeah. forgot they sold another business property and they're so doing that. They, could, they just... couldn't go back and say, hey, you know what? We're just not going to claim these deductions. Take it off. It's OK. We'll just eat the cost. Somebody couldn't do that. They can. Yeah. But again, it has to just be like they're doing. So what you come across sometimes is people that are talking to a loan officer like me. And the loan officer is doing their taxes almost in theory for them and saying, here's what I want your accountant to do. That way you qualify for a loan. So we're never supposed to give any tax advice. It of has course. to be like kind of genuine where they were thinking about doing this anyways yeah. with their accountant. And yeah, we could definitely use amended returns. We see them all the time. There's no problem okay. with that. Is uh, there a certain just, time frame in the year? It's like you're too late to do an amendment on your return. Like is it, is it August, September of the year? No, there's really, really never too late to do it. The only time you might see some issues is right around tax season, because usually when you're self-employed, we not only look at your tax returns, but we also want to make sure the IRS has received the tax return. So we will pull what's called the tax transcript. We okay. use it for audit reasons, because that means the IRS has, the, the information has gone through their intake portal. It's on their system. It's real in their world now. And Obviously, this time of year is perfect where it's going to be a little bit slower getting that tax return processed by the IRS because their yeah. volume of people filing taxes is right. greater. So I would say do that, you know, two or three months prior to trying to actually close on a home. That way you'll have a nice, nice cushion there. You won't have any longstanding delays. With the IRS. So are you saying it's just going to be harder for them to get these tax transcripts during tax time because the government is just so inundated with so much stuff coming in it takes longer for it to get into their files if you're filing taxes or amending taxes right around this time so another way of explaining that is if someone's self-employed and they want to use their income from 2022 and they called me and said kevin i'm going to file my taxes right now we're going to send them into the irs i will say that's great give me a copy of your tax return but now we have to wait until that return gets submitted and filed by the IRS. So Otherwise, until that happens, so until that happens, the underwriters can be like, we're waiting for that. We're waiting for that. Or we have to go off of 2020 and 2021's income. Okay. That's All how right. That Which work. they they didn't amend. Right. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's, that's where a, timing so that's becomes a, important. Yeah. And timing, very important that, you know, if they're making an offer, you know, me as an agent, I need to know that. I don't need to know exactly what the tax return says, but I need to know like, hey, we're going to be waiting for transcripts to be registered with the government and it might take four or six weeks. Yeah. So I'll know like offer closing time, you know, no one wants to tick off a seller and say, we need six more weeks. Yeah. And same <laughs> it with- doesn't go I, well. <laughs> I see a lot of people that sometimes don't file taxes at all. And that's not good in our industry. We typically want to be able to validate that. So- you know, I, I'm, we know someone that is falling into this category where they didn't file taxes for four years and now they want to file them all at one time. Well, that's not an overnight thing. I mean, you have to structure yeah. all this, prepare it, document it, and then the IRS has to receive it, log it into their system so we can validate this through tax transcripts and make sure that this is not just kind of a dummied up tax return because anybody can create a tax return. And send it yeah. over to me. We want to make right. sure it's been filed and accepted by the IRS. All right. So all of you watching there, you know, you know, that is probably, you know, one of the bonehead moves is not paying your taxes. No offense to all of you. 
I know you're all busy lives and stuff, and it may not be intentional or anything like that, but always make that a priority because you just never know when you're in a position where it's like, I need to buy a house. And, you know, the market be, could be changing. And by the time start things get filed with the government and stuff, the market could have changed. Right. So you never yeah. know when you're going to be in a situation where you got to move fast. So it's good to, you know, good for all of you watching this video so you can check off these boxes and go, you know what, I think I better do my taxes, even though I don't have plans on buying my house right away. Uh, or, you know, I don't know when, but I better have all of those things in order. So if anything happens in my life and I got to move pretty quickly, everything is all aligned. Yeah. And another thing, good advice, something definitely good advice and something I hear a lot, especially with a relatively newer business owner, people will say, you know, my last couple of years, I don't show a lot of income, but this year, I really hit a home run business wise. And they'll tell me this kind of like halfway through the year. They don't realize we can't use income if you own a business throughout the year until you file your taxes after that. Close year it out. Over. Yeah. So you only go off of your tax returns. Generally speaking, there's okay. some unique so, one -off so they programs. can't go to you. They can't go to you and say, hey, I didn't do my tax returns last year, but it's it's January 1st. And I had a great year last year. And here's all the deposits to show you all the income that came in. You're going to be like, I can't, it doesn't have any meaning to it yet. Yeah. According to the industry loan programs, you can't do that. Now, there are some one-off programs. You probably maybe have heard of like what's called a bank statement loan that you might be able to use that. But that's one out of a thousand self-employed business owners are going to fall into that category. The general guidelines will call for two years of your federal personal tax returns and business tax returns. So if okay. the IRS doesn't see it, we can't use it. Okay. All right. Well, there you go, yeah. everyone. And then as you know, getting back to the employment part of all of this, you talk about stability. I like the, how you said predictability. What if somebody's making a lateral move on income and, and it's an employee, the new job is an employed job. You know, there's no, it's not based on performance. The income's not based on performance or anything, but totally new profession. Like here's an example. Let's say someone's been working for 10 years and they had a solid job, but they were like, I know that's going to be a ceiling in my life. I'm going to change professions. I'm going to grad school, got a scholarship on grad school, new, no school payments. And they finish grad school and they, they get a different job because they know, this is where I want to go in my future. But the new job is basically the same salary. It's employed. It's at a good company. They have a they have an employment contract even. Is, do they still have to show two years because it's a totally new profession? Good question. And the two-year thing, we always ask about two years. The, the standard loan application covers a 24-month history of where you lived and where you've worked. So we're always going to go into that. Plus, we want to make sure there's no long-standing gap of unemployment. But in that case, by the way, schooling counts as your employment because you're doing something to better your life. As I always refer to it, is the needle pointing up? And the answer in that example would be yes. You went to school, you got a different certificate or degree, and now you're switching careers. And it, that totally makes sense. So that would be perfect. You can often switch careers. It's just if you're doing it rapidly, meaning three, four, five jobs within two years, now you have a little bit of unstable employment background. So actually with an FHA loan, the guideline states, if you have four or more jobs in the last two years, you have to validate that last job change. Did you go to school? You know, if you came, became a nurse, you got a nursing certificate and you got a different job as a nurse, that makes sense. But if you're going, you know, working from Best Buy, then you're going to get a job at a car dealer. Then you're going to get a job at T-Mobile. That's just bouncing around. And that's where you could have a little bit of an issue. But you can switch careers. It's not the end of the world. It just all has to make sense. And it has to kind of line up based on what kind of income we're going to use. And what, what if it's a new job, you know, and maybe the income's even better, but it requires them to move out of state. They have to totally change their, you know, where they live. Starting a whole new life, basically. Okay. And, yeah. you know, like, hey, I, I move into Minnesota and we want to buy a house there. We got kids. We want to buy a house. Got a new job. It's a great job. Finished school. How does that play? 
And so uh, just allowed. like any other job. So no restrictions to that. In fact, that is common with someone coming out of college. You know, let's say you're graduating Purdue with an engineering degree and you got a job at, you know, some big company as an engineer and you have a starting salary of $70,000, we can see it on your employment letter. You can start day one. You can buy house really? day one. So you don't have to Really? Have, Just out of college? Yep. Yeah. You don't have to have a two-year employment history because, again, that schooling counts as this two-year history. Even if you're out of high school, really, you get a job in the trades, you went through your, I forget what they call it, not an internship, but... You know, you kind of go through trade your trade school, school. Trade school. Um, yeah. you go apprentice, you go through your apprenticeship and then you get a job working in a union. I mean, all of that goes together and it all makes sense and it's logical. And this happens all the time. It's just when things kind of don't line up the right way or are constantly going against the grain is when you're going to have problems. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just learned something new because yeah. I had no idea school can apply towards time as employment. Yeah. Well, it, it counts like part of your two year history. What have you been doing? I've been in yeah, school. Yeah, for four yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Two year history. I, you of, know, of I have a, a salary job, especially salary as good as gold. And we can document all that with your signed employment letter. We have your start date. You could even buy a house before you start working, which I. So I could tell my son, you know what? You can get a loan. Yeah. I, depending on what he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can get a I loan. Mean, so. What about if somebody gets out of college and you know how it is in the younger generation? They bounce a little bit, but in the same industry because they're trying to climb the ladder fast. Yeah. But they're in this, you know, they're doing the same type of work. And maybe the company's a little bit different of a business, but their role is basically the same. And they go through three, four jobs in four years. And now they're more at that stable point of like, this is a company I'm going to stay at for a while. And the first few years were like climbing the ladder, right? Pay your dues. Yeah. Right. How does that fall into play for those people? It kind of goes back to what I was saying before, like, is the needle pointing up? Is this a progressive change? Are okay. we moving in the right direction or are you just all over the place and you coming and going, don't know where yeah. you're going? Okay. Um, and it also the income matters. So if your hourly pay scale, we're going to look at the income you've been earning over the last 24 months. And if your income is all over the place and if, you know, this is common where buyers don't know what their income is. So if you don't know what it is, how are we going to know what it is? So we're going to take the most conservative average that we can, but yeah. someone that's, especially if they're bouncing around within with the same company, that really won't matter, but we want to make sure they're full time and there's a pattern and a track record where we can track their income. And it looks like I said, like it's stable and we can predict where that income is going. So okay, sometimes cool. it is a great area where it is hard to kind of pick through that. And it's a little bit of an unknown and we try to make the most educated guess on what we're going to work with or mm -hmm. the most conservative calculation of income possible because we don't want to over calculate income because that could lead yeah. to a disaster. Right. And can you can a lender do all of that even before a buyer goes out to make an offer on a home? Say, you know what, run everything and make absolutely sure I'm not going to have any surprises with my income and employment situation. You know, can you do yeah. that even prior to, you know, under contract doing formal underwriting, you know, yes. can you do that? It, you can, it can be done. It's not the standard practice because there's cost involved with doing that. Once we start the verification process, then we or lenders start incurring costs, which creates overhead. And a lot of buyers don't want to start paying any third party stuff if we have to charge them for it. So a lot of employers, believe it or not, will charge us to verify employment, or they might outsource that to a third-party company to do all their verifications. Hmm. Well, any third-party company is going to charge anyone to do anything. Somebody's got to pay for it. Yeah. Just right. like condo so documentation, like there's a fee to get that stuff. So yeah. usually what it happens or how it happens is it rests on my shoulders. Someone like me, I do all the verification. I read the guidelines, do all the vetting. If I can't figure this out, then I go to my review department, which is known as our underwriting department. And then I send it over to them. They're going to look at it. If they can't figure it out, they might even make calls to Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA. If there's still gray area, that's where we go to, okay, do we want to submit this as a full review subject to finding that property that you want to buy? And that's where, that's like a formal loan application to a certain degree. Right. So yeah. We really okay. have to do that. Usually we can figure this out in advance or give enough of a, like an answer on whether or not this is going to work or how it's going to work. Right. to where it would make sense, or it's just usually off the chart where it just doesn't make sense. 
Right. Well, you well, and the reason I ask is because, you know, when it's a competitive market out there for buyers purchasing and they're competing against other buyers and they're not a cash buyer and they're trying to compete with cash buyers, can they get what we, you know, it's known as a conditional approval where the lender says all we need is an appraisal, a title, a clear title report and a contract. Yeah, that does exist. Done with everything so else. Yeah. It does exist. It's just not as commonly used because that's more of a procedure. And usually, as you know, people find a property spur of the moment. They want to make an offer on it today. Sure. You don't have course, time yeah. to, to process all that within, you know, six hours. So, so can, a, people, can a buyer say, you know what, I want to get conditionally approved and then I'm going to go out and look at homes. And if they do that, how long is that conditionally approved situation valid? before it expires. Yeah, they, they can do that. That is valid for, I believe, 90 days is how okay. long that approval is valid, but that is a legitimate loan approval. So we're going to go through the motions like we normally would. We still collect the deposit as if we're going to order an appraisal because we may have to do that at some point. If anything changed along the way, we're going to have to hurry up and document it, just like the soft credit polls, all that stuff. Um, and you have to buy a house within that time frame. If you start looking at different houses, we're going to update that in the file. You can only do that so many times. So yeah. there's usually so a stay focused. Like, so, so the buyer yeah. should stay focused, no, stick to a price range and have a plan and not worry about a pink toilet. See, that's yeah, and that's exactly the, the problem with <laughs> you know? it. Sometimes they want to increase their price range by a hundred thousand. Well, now we're re-underwriting that file. That's a totally different price range, totally different payment. You right. can only do that so many times. So it's not like a shotgun approach where you can go search for anything you want. It has to be more of a really calculated yeah. approach when you're doing have a that strategy. fully underwritten. So yeah, have a strategy and stick to it, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Stick to it. Well, the last thing is savings. You know, everyone, a lot of people think like, I got to have 20% down. You know, I, I'm not ready to buy because I don't have enough money to put down yet. So it's going to take me time. And you know, for some people, it's a real struggle these days to to set aside money quick enough to get them into a home, you know, thinking they need 20% down and to try and have that saved in a year if they had nothing a year ago. That's very hard for a lot of people. With it's, it's And hard, yeah. still keeping their bills paid. Right, right? still living a life. It's that, yeah, it's the balance of got to pay bills and all of that and save money. So, you know, what's reasonable? What's reasonable for, for people to be thinking about what they need to have saved? Do you have any kind of like ratios or anything like that for them to have um, as guidelines to think about? Yeah. So this, this does come up all the time. So people assume you need 20% down or on the opposite end, they assume you don't need any money, which creates a whole bunch of problems if you're not planning and preparing. So saving money is very difficult. You can't save 20% within 60 days. It just doesn't work that way. So if you're kind of looking at your average price range, you know, under a million dollars, let's say, um, you don't need 20% down. You, I mean, it's always helpful to put more money down, but it's certainly not a requirement. So I will always try to figure out like payment ranges that people want to fall into. And sometimes your down payment will, will help figure that out. But in terms of the money itself, five, 10% down is perfectly doable for every single buyer out there. So you don't need to save 20%. Um, on what about a buyer side, that has like that 570 credit score? Yeah, so credit Are you does, looking for more down if the score is low? Yeah, yeah, and that's a whole nother kind of ball of wax because all these guidelines are kind of intertwined. So the common question might come up is people might say, hey, what's the minimum credit score I need? And I might tell them, okay, here's what the score is in writing according to the industry guidelines. But that doesn't mean you automatically qualify if you have that. Because if you have low down payment, if you have real high debt load, the computer systems may not approve that. So you need some sort of compensating factor if you're scraping the bottom of the barrel with credit score or something else. Now, what if somebody so, has low credit score, but they have really, like, they're coming out of a divorce and, you know, their credit got slammed mm -hmm. from that. And, but they have really a good income. They're, you know, they got great income. They're making six digits, you know, 500,000, but their credit scores just got tanked yep. from an experience that they went through. And, and a lot of it was lost because of the situation. So they, they didn't have, they had to give up a lot of cash. They don't have a down or they have very minimal down, but they got great income. 
great income, you know, and they hit this bump in the road. You yeah. Know, what, so, what, do you, what can they do? You know, what see, options that's a, that's are there? a compensating factor. So if you have a low score, but you still meet the written requirement. So let's say on a conventional loan, for example, because that's usually what most people start targeting. 620 is the lowest score. So you have to have a 620. That, so let's say in your example, good. Someone, that's, that's pretty low. I mean, right. I still so let's say someone yeah. has a 630 credit score and they have really good income and a good down payment. That's something that we can help them qualify with because they have compensating factors. That becomes an issue when they have the bare bones minimum. So when you have the minimum credit, minimum down payment and not great income, that's going to be difficult to qualify because it's all three levels of, of what risk if the right income's there. high though, but the credit's poor and yeah. they, they have very little saved, very little in the bank. It depends. There's no answer on that. We won't know until we run it through our system. It could work, okay. but all it right. all maps back to what's called automated underwriting. We run it through a computer engine. That computer system is something the whole industry uses collectively in the United States. Any mortgage company, any bank is going to use the same software and it has to read that data. And if it accepts it, then you're approvable. But I mean, if that really is a strong enough compensating factor, that could put them over the top because we go off of something called your debt to income ratio, yeah. which calculates you know, your income and how much you're spending on debt. If you're living mm -hmm. well below your means, the computer systems tend to approve it with a really strong compensating factor. Down payment is one of them that does cure a lot. When you have a lot of money down, that offsets a lot of risk in the lending world. Sure. But if they if their credit is low, they don't have much in savings, but they have high income and they don't have a lot on their credit cards and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just this it was just, you know, a divorce or something, a short period of time really sunk them down. And, you know, they're past that, but the credit score is still low. Um, but they, they don't have a lot of, or, or could this not even exist if they don't have much on their credit cards Would their credit score not be low? No. Well, if, I mean, the divorce itself doesn't really affect your credit. It's something being missed, like, a you know, an ex spouse is intentionally missing payments. So the, the credit yeah, bureaus don't see right. divorce. We're, they're going to just go off of missed payments okay. on it. On the account. So, so if you get rid of a spouse that was abusing the credit cards and stuff, they're gone. And now, you know, that's that activity has stopped. Yeah. But so that until those in the eyes of the credit okay bureau, that, the, it doesn't matter. Yeah. The divorce really doesn't tie into that because the credit bureau doesn't see that. So they're just going to, the credit report is a credit report. Okay. So that's its own entity. But in that case, we have to come up with a compensating factor. Really, really good income could help. So it could work. I mean, it's you just, couldn't you, didn't, you couldn't go knock on the underwriter's door and say, "Hey, hey. no, you know, no," because it goes to Fannie Mae and Freddie slant. Mac. So, <laughs> all right, so where... you don't have an in with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. You don't have an no. in. <laughs> no, unfortunately, <laughs> that's not going to work. So that's that's how it that's how automated underwriting works. So it's going to read the data that's there, and it but is a snapshot in time. Let's say you do the automated underwriting and stuff, and let's say you know, like you know your underwriter, and say, "Hey, I know this is going to show up on your." This is the explanation, but behind all of this, and a, a, a lender funds their own loans. You, the whole situation scenario is explained and saying they got good income. Year from now, this is going to be paid off. They got rid of the, the the crazy spender. They're out of the picture. They have no access to these credit cards anymore and stuff. Is that something that can be explained, or it's like, hey, proof is in the pudding? Yeah, it depends on what the exact circumstances would be, but it all has to be documentable. So I've had situations like that where there is, let's say, a bankruptcy, and that bankruptcy was because a spouse decided to up and leave and they were the breadwinner. If you can prove, and this is what falls under a different category, which is known as manual underwriting. So this is like extenuating circumstances where A, B, and C happen because of something. And we can prove that all these events happen after the date of something occurring. You might need 10% down. So usually there's a little bit stronger down payment requirements. And it does go, it bypasses the computer system. We do manual underwriting. And that's when you can talk to an underwriter and say, okay, here's the situation. Here's the timeline. Here's all the documentation. But there's a whole separate set of guidelines that you have to follow for manual underwriting. So it's not an automatic that they're going to take everything. 
that particular buyer would have to meet all this subset of guidelines. But again, it has to be leading, all this stuff has to happen after this event occurred. Because then you can say, hey, my credit was destroyed after my ex-spouse decided to leave me and then destroy our credits. Before that, you can see it was flawless. So it could happen. Yeah. But it's got to be all documentable. Right. All right. Well, we've uh, been going a long time on all this. There's just so much to talk about. Three categories to be thinking about just to wrap up is your credit, your employment, and savings. Any words of advice if you had to do the elevator speech, Kevin? Cash is king. So having savings can cure all, whether it's paying off debt, putting more money down, or just showing that you have a lot of reserves in the bank, that becomes a massive compensating factor in today's industry. Cash is king. Save, save, and if save. They, and, and if uh, they can't make the cash happen to the ex extent to be that way, then have solid employment, really good credit, and keep your spending low. Yep. Exactly. Would you say that's, that pretty much sums it up? Yeah, absolutely. All right. But- should buyers assume, hey, I shouldn't make assumptions. I should talk to a lender and see if there are options out there that I'm not aware of because you don't know what you don't know, right? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Most people, when they assume something, when it's related to the mortgage lending world, they're way off on it. So, and it goes both ways. People that have a ton of money, ton of income. They don't think they qualify or the people they have no income, no money. They think they can just walk in and buy a house like they're buying a gallon of milk at the grocery store. Okay. So yeah, right. you definitely need to prepare because, you know, something else is these guidelines change constantly as time evolves. So just because someone bought a house last year or two years or 10 years ago, doesn't mean it's the same thing nowadays. So you have to. Well, that's like the IDA, the IDA program that was limited to different certain territories in Illinois. Yeah. Now they open it up to the whole state, right? Now you it's can, the whole state. It yep. could be Income. any address. Yeah. They're income restricted, but those income limits have gone way up. So a lot of people can qualify. What is it at for, now? For Ida. Generally speaking, 125. So it's 125,000. $125, yeah. That's a lot of that's a lot of income. That's so a pretty a good income. Yeah. That. And still qualify for it. Do they yeah. have to be a first time home buyer to use no. Ida? Nope. You could have owned a house before. By definition, a first time home buyer is someone that has not owned a house in the last three years. Okay. But you could consecutive you could cons be, last three consecutive years, not yeah. owned a house. Okay. So they could have owned a house 20 years ago for 15 years and then stopped owning it. And the last three years they rented, now they qualify as a first time buyer again. Yeah. Yeah. That's first time buyer. Ida actually allows, if someone sold a house six months ago, they want to buy a new one, they can use Ida again. So could somebody say, you know what, I'm going to rent out my house for three years and I'm going to go rent somewhere else. And I'm going to just get a lot of cash flow from the rental you know, rent something cheaper than they what their mortgage is. It can't be consecutive sell. owners. You have to sell it. Oh, they have to sell it. Yeah. So that's, you can't use it to leverage they could, it. They couldn't claim it as like, hey, that was just an investment home. No, because they own a property at the exact same time they're closing. All right. So, so whether it's a, so whether it's primary or investment, it's still a property they own. They can't be considered a first time buyer. Right. Okay. Yep. I'm always trying to think outside the box. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's all, you know, it's got to be all legit. You know, mm -hmm. obviously we want it legit. Kevin, thank you for your time and sharing stories and lots of information. Hopefully we can get this all in there properly for everyone to see. How can people reach you if they need to get in touch with you? Yeah, best way is just give me a call or text me. My phone number is area code 630-956-2648. And for all of you that if you're like, I don't want to get on a phone with anyone, I'm. this is so premature for me. I just want more information about lending without having to talk to people. You can just text the code on my screen, get a loan at 630-931-0045. And we'll be happy to just to, you know send you information and we won't tie you up on a phone call, okay? So thanks all for watching. I appreciate it. You know where to reach us. Either call Kevin, text text the code, or you can call me directly also on that number on my screen. And we'd love to help you out, even if it's just doing a, a service, you know, a service call and giving you some advice. Sound good, Kevin? Sounds great. Thanks for all having right. me, Christine. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.